I just felt like that Andrew needed an intro <laughs> because he's awesome and he's my husband. If you don't know us, um, this is Andrew and I'm Heather and we started this church seven years ago um, by the grace of God and we have been married 11 years with three babies um, and I just felt when I was sitting there um, when the Lord says he loves when we dwell in unity together, I just felt it was really important for me to introduce my husband because we are one and we are unified together and that is is um, the blessing of the house of the Lord that we get under is when um, we dwell in unity. And so I just wanted to honor him as the man of God that he is. And if you've been around for a while, you have seen that he has been tested and tried and found to be a man of integrity. And if you are new here, I want you to know that he is a man who has been tested and tried and found to be a man of integrity. And so that is why the Lord is um, allowing him to lead, is out of his humility. And so I want you to know that. Um, I hope that that settles your heart um, for some of you. And um, he's going to bring the word of the Lord to us. So no pressure, but um, I'm going to pray for him. Thank you, God, for this man that is a gift to all of us. Thank you that he has continually inquired of you. And we are thankful that he is a Allowing you to speak through him. And so um, tonight, we are expectant, Lord, um, that not out of striving or effort, but just simply because he is a son um, of you and we are also his children, that we get to sit and receive from you um, this evening. And so we pray um, just peace of God, um, the fire of God over him, that he would speak your words and that every person here would would hear your voice clearly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, babe. You made me feel good. Uh, where did everybody on the 420 team just go? Oh, there's a few of you. Is that everybody? Or did some... Okay, if you're from 420, stand up. You gotta run around with that awesome crew. Where'd Jeff go? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all so much. They'll be back. Hey, stay standing. Stay standing. Come on in here, bro. Uh, they'll be back up here in a minute. But just so thankful for you guys. So proud of you. Um, man, so thankful for the interactions we have as our body with your body and all the different overlaps. We love you guys. We trust you guys. I'm really proud of you. And uh, you guys are the real deal. And these people are the real deal. And we're blessed that they're in our city. We get to do this gospel thing together. I'm really proud of know some of the behind the scenes stuff. You're just the real deal. And I'm so proud of you. And as we were worshiping, I just simple word from the Lord. I believe is from the Lord that he wants you to know he hears you. I felt the Lord say, I'm, I hear you. And I know that that's like your heartbeat. Um, just the way Clay, you introed us tonight. And I was reminded of last year at the end, I think it was the first night, um, there, uh, Rob MacArthur from Scotland gave us this word that he felt the Lord turn towards us in that first night last year and say, you have my attention. And I felt that for, the, for you guys tonight, just as a people, the Lord saying, I hear you and you have my attention. So praise the Lord. Amen. Love you. Love you. Okay, open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're already chewing through the time, so we're going to jump into it. Praise the Lord. Stand for the reading of the Word of God, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the Word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli... Whose, high, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. 
So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again. (laughs) Praise God. The third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. I lost my spot. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Anybody hoping to hear that this weekend? (laughs) Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. I want to share a message with you tonight called, Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Lord, that is our prayer. Come and speak. Open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies. Lord, open us up to you. We come to you and we say, speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Some of you know my personal story, but I grew up in church, going to a Christian school, but I wouldn't say that kind of hearing God speak was something that I had much of a grid for growing up. Now, I want to be fair. That being said, that doesn't mean that nobody ever tried to tell me about that. Looking back, I missed a lot. There was a lot I wasn't listening to growing up. So that's not, I'm not putting that on anybody else. That's more of a confession, probably. I'm sure some really great people, my parents tried to help me out with that, but call it a thick head. It didn't get through. So I'm not, I don't want to knock on anybody. That's just where I was. I didn't have a grid for that. About halfway through my junior year of high school, I started to get this feeling. You ever had a feeling? <laughs> I started to get this feeling that God had a call on my life. I wasn't walking with God. I wasn't pursuing God. I was living in a lot of sin and a life that was pretty much 100% centered around me. But I had this feeling. I had this feeling that God wanted to do something with me. That's all I could say. That's all, that's all the language I had. That's all I had kind of a grid for on my insides. I feel like... God wants to do something with me. There was this one uh, guy on staff at the school that I went to growing up that I would talk to about this sometimes and just kind of share my angst with him because I just was like, I think God wants to do something with my life. And he just was amazing and patient. But I couldn't get rid of the feeling, but I also couldn't get clarity on it. And so I was just kind of getting frustrated. And I remember one night hanging out late with some friends at a park. Uh, We're just kind of laying in the grass, talking, looking at the stars, talking Lion King style. You know, those existential nights underneath the stars. What do you think those are up there? (laughs) We were kind of 
all in this same boat as far as we were, where we were at with God, where we were at as far as the environment we grew up in, but not really walking with the Lord, uh, not currently pursuing the Lord. And I remember telling my friends, you know, I, I just get this feeling. I think God has a call on my life. I think God has like a big call on my life. I think he wants to do something with me. And they all just kind of laughed at me. And they were like, wow, good for you. It's kind of arrogant that you're the one that thinks that God wants to do something with you. What's so great about you? Like, we all know each other. Come on, honestly. You know, one of those things. So I had this feeling, but I didn't know what it meant, and I didn't know what to do with it. But I also wasn't putting any effort into, like, you know, talking to God about it or anything like that. So it left me frustrated and specifically pretty frustrated at God. I felt like God was dangling a carrot out in front of me. You know those cartoons with the carrot and the donkey to get the donkey to run faster? They just put the carrot out there and you got to chase that thing, but you never catch it. That's what I felt like God was doing to me. He had everything I wanted. There was something in me that knew that whatever it was that God wanted to do with me was what I really wanted, but I couldn't get what I wanted. He was dangling this carrot out in front of me, and I couldn't reach it. So throughout that last 18 months or so of high school, there was this inner frustration building at God. If you have what I want, why won't you just give it to me? Have you prayed that prayer before? You ever needed something and been like, well, God, you're sovereign. You kind of know everything. You kind of have everything. Why don't you just give it to me? I was frustrated. Again, I wasn't doing anything about it. I wasn't doing anything to pursue God or learn how to hear him speak more clearly. But the bottom line is I was a child. <laughs> And children do childish things. And so I was being childish. So high school ends. I go to Baylor for my freshman year. And one of the two people that I knew at the time in the whole state of Texas was Chad Frege. Shout out. He's back in Texas now. Huh. Full circle. Whoa. Um, so it was Chad Frege. He was a senior at the time that I was a freshman. And he had gotten involved at Antioch in Waco during his time in college, and he picked me up on the first Wednesday night of my freshman year to take me to the first Antioch college service that was happening kind of back from summer break for everybody. And there's a lot to say about kind of what was going on on my inside as I kind of stepped into that environment and what God was doing, kind of what I was observing throughout the service. But the point that I'm trying to get to tonight is that I remember that they had some more worship uh, after the sermon, and I kind of started participating in that worship. And at some point during that worship at the end, I ended up on the floor weeping. And I wasn't a crier back then. I'm probably less of a crier now, honestly. Nobody talked to me. Nobody touched me. I was just on the ground weeping. That had never happened before. I didn't know what to do with what was happening. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't have language at the time for what I was experiencing in the moment and definitely didn't have language for it in kind of the moments following or the time and months following. But looking back, you know, the language I have for it now is that was an encounter with God. That's all I know to say about what that was. I had an encounter with Jesus, and I heard him speak to me. So looking back, I know what that was, was that was an encounter with God, and what happened was I heard his voice. I heard him speak to me, speak to me clearly. And from what I can remember, that was really the first time that I had heard God speak so clearly. I didn't hear a voice, and I can't pinpoint the moment, you know, like I'd been down there for a few minutes and then I heard it. It just was kind of all this one experience of encountering Jesus and hearing God speak to me. And what he said to me was, Andrew, I love that he says, Samuel, Andrew, I know you've been frustrated with me for a long time, but this is where I've been bringing you to show you the man I made you to be. 
I had no idea what that meant. I didn't even really know I was hearing it. It was just sort of happening. I didn't know that I had heard God's voice. All I knew was that this thing was happening and experiencing God speak, it felt like the weight of the world had lifted off my soul or something like that. So much so that the only thing I could do was kind of lay on the ground and cry about it. We are all made to hear the voice of God, to experience and encounter the living God. We are made to be adopted as children of the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit and participate with Him in His kingdom. We are made to see His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are made as humans to encounter, to know this God. This prayer, speak Lord, I'm listening. It is not an idea that we came up with for Kingdom Conference that sounded really cool because we like the story in 1 Samuel chapter 3. It is not something that we are as a community tonight and this weekend bringing to God as some sort of petition. Look, Lord, we're listening. We're listening, so please speak, because we're listening, you know? Praise God, it's never been my effort, right? right? That, that's not what speak, Lord, I'm listening is. It's not a petition to the Lord in that sense. As our leadership team was praying in the kingdom conference over these last several months. This is what the Lord gave to us to pray. He, he, he put this prayer to us. It's not a prayer where we are trying to get God to speak. It's a prayer that God has given us to bring us into what he already wants to speak. It's God saying, hey, I'm speaking. Listen. So pray this prayer. It's not a prayer to get God to speak. It's a prayer to get us to listen. This prayer, as you probably noticed, comes out of 1 Samuel chapter 3. And as we go into this weekend with this prayer, speak, Lord, I'm listening. As we live as people who are desperate to hear the voice of God, I want to walk through this story that God has highlighted for us this weekend to see what can we learn about how to listen to this God who speaks to us. So we're just going to go through the story. Verse 1, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. There are times when the word of the Lord seems rare. There are times when it is hard to see God and understand what he's doing. Sometimes it's because we aren't listening or watching and that's what I was experiencing in high school. I wasn't really paying attention, but it seemed that the word of the Lord was rare. Sometimes it's because God and his goodness and his wisdom and his sovereignty and his sovereignty is making himself in some sense hidden from us. Sometimes it's because we are apathetic and busy, distracted, faithless, weary. Sometimes we're in sin and we're listening to a lot of other voices, but there are just times when the word of the Lord seems rare, when it doesn't seem very frequent that you get a vision of God and what he's doing. But remember that even when our experiences of God are changing, God is not changing. Even when your life changes, God does not change. You may not hear or see him, but that doesn't mean he cannot be heard and cannot be seen. It does not mean that he is not speaking, that he is not moving just because you can't see it. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. We must never forget, friends, 
That we are not fitting God into our story. And therefore, he ought to speak to us. And if we can't hear him, he must not be speaking. If we can't see him, he must not be moving. No, my friends, he is bringing us into his story. The last section of chapter 2, we read chapter 3, in verse 227, it starts with this. Right before the verse where it says, uh, the word of the Lord was rare and there was no frequent vision. The section right before that, it says, and there came a man of God to Eli and he said to him, we get a, a visit from a prophet at the end of the previous chapter. So I'm just saying, even in a time when the word of the Lord was rare, he was never silent. Even when there was no frequent vision, he was never completely hidden. He's still speaking. He's still revealing himself. And he's doing that because he does not change. This may sound silly, but I want you to write this down. This is an important key we get here when it comes to listening to the voice of God. Write this down. God is always doing his thing. He may not be doing your thing in the moment, but God is always doing his thing. He is always doing his thing. Now, just, just for an example, here, I'll hold mine up. Look at how much Bible is before and after 1 Samuel chapter 3. Look how much story is before that. Look how much story is after that. 1 Samuel chapter 3 is not the whole story. When the word of the Lord seems rare to you, it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. See, 1 Samuel chapter 3 kind of happens right smack dab in the middle of a lot of God doing his thing. God may be kind of a rare voice and a rare vision for them at the time, but he's spoken to Abraham. He's about to call David. Jesus is coming. That's good. Here comes the Holy Spirit to pour out. The church is going to be birthed. You're going to come to Kingdom Conference in 2023, and the new heavens and new earth are on their way, and Jesus is returning. God is always doing that. He is always doing his thing, even when he's hard to hear for you, even when it's hard for you to see him. God is always doing his thing, whether you see him or not, whether you hear him or not, whether you're into it or not, whether you're pursuing it or not, whether you're asking him to be involved in it or not. He said to me, Andrew, this is where I've been bringing you. I hadn't been listening. How did he do that? You were guiding me this whole time that I wasn't paying attention? He's doing his thing, friends. It may be rare. It may be hard to see. But God is always doing his thing. And when you can't hear him very well, when you can't see him very well, take some lead from Samuel here. Now, the boy was ministering to the Lord. Keep coming. Keep coming to the presence of God. Even when the, when the word is rare and the vision is infrequent, keep coming into the presence of the Lord. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. We get introduced to something interesting here. The lamp of God. The lamp of God. What is the lamp of God? So we're talking about kind of the... the temple and tabernacle deal going on here. And so this is happening at nighttime and they would just keep candles lit throughout the night. Nothing super crazy, but this was the lamp of God. Uh, God's presence never leaves. He, he doesn't sleep. That's what these candles are representing. Amen. God doesn't get tired like me. Praise the Lord. So they're just literal candles that burn throughout the night. So practically, what this little bit of information is telling us is that this whole encounter happened at nighttime. But that's not why the words are here. We know it happened at nighttime. They were sleeping. We already, we already know that part. There's more going on here. What else is going on here? Well, just, we've just been told that the word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no frequent vision. 
We just talked about how chapter 2 ends with God rejecting Eli's household. That's, the, that's what the, the, the prophet who comes to Eli at the end of chapter 2, that's what he talks about. He tells, he tells Eli to his face, you and your whole family, you're getting rejected as the high priest. Okay. All right, so the word of the Lord is rare in those days. There's no frequent vision. Chapter 2 ends with God rejecting Eli's household rejecting his high priest. And now we're being told that Eli, this high priest who's in kind of the midst of being rejected from God, is losing his eyesight. His eyesight has become so dim that he could not see. What's happening here spiritually is it's painting the picture. The prophets, they're not hearing very much. The high priest, he's not seeing very well. But even then, the lamp of God has not gone out. Even then, the lamp of God still burns. Though nations turn, though leaders turn, though people fail, though there are seasons where it seems that God is sovereignly silent and he isn't easy to hear or to understand or to feel or to be aware of, though the night be long and darkness surround me, the lamp of God does not go out you want to hear God, remember, the lamp of God does not go out. Even when the clouds are thick and darkness surrounds him, the lamp of God does not go out. Even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the lamp of God does not go out. Even when everything is dark and void and chaos is hovering over the deep, the lamp of God does not go out. Even when darkness falls on the land from the sixth to the ninth hour, the lamp of God does not go out. Even when he clothes the heavens with blackness, the lamp of God does not go out. Even when he makes darkness his hiding place and darkness his canopy, the lamp of God does not go out. The oil of the Lord never runs dry. The fire of the Lord is always burning. You may not be hearing or seeing or feeling him, but no matter how long the night may seem, even if you descend down to Hades there, he is with me. My God, he can seem so far away. It can seem like it's been so long. It can seem like he's so hidden, but the lamp of God does not go out. The lamp of God has not gone out. Keep listening. Keep laying down in the temple of the Lord. Keep going to where the presence of God is. Yes, the Lord can find you anywhere. He can speak to you at any time. He can chase you down and search you out. But why make him? Be found in the presence of God. Stay near to his lamp. Stay near to his presence. Keep the faith, my friends. God is alive. He is moving, working, building. He is speaking even when you cannot hear him. He is speaking if he may not be so obviously speaking to you. You may have lost faith in your ability to hear his voice, but never lose faith in his ability to speak. You may even feel like you've lost faith in his faithfulness to you, but never lose faith in his faithfulness to himself. The lamp of God does not go out. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. I'm encouraged to know at this point of the story that Samuel was not a professional prophet. When this happened, he didn't know he was a prophet. He didn't even know the voice of the Lord. I mean, goodness gracious, the Lord showed up three times and said his name. He's got no clue 
what's going on. God spoke to this boy audibly, and he ran to Eli three times. He was not a pro, and you don't have to be either. Maybe you can't be a prophet, but can you be a child who comes into the presence of God? You may not have prophet-like faith, but all you need is childlike faith. Faith that shows up. Faith that listens, not because you're a prophet, but because God speaks. And you already have that faith that shows up because you're here. Verse 8, a third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Eli finally catches on to what's happening here and realizes that this boy needs some coaching. He needs some coaching on hearing the voice of God. So let's talk about some coaching. How do we hear the voice of God? I'm going to talk about a few different questions here. First one is, how do I hear God? How, how do I hear God? I'm saying, speak, Lord, I'm listening. How do I hear God? Number one, give yourself to the word of God. Read your Bible a lot. Read your Bible. Read it, and then read it again, and keep reading it. Keep reading the word of the Lord. Read it, study it, know it, think about it, digest it, memorize it, orient around it, talk about it, talk about it some more, and then read it and talk about it some more. Give yourself to the word of God, not just kind of the verse by verse reading it, but, but know the stories, know the themes, know the ebbs and the flows. It's bottomless and endless and eternal and living and active. Give yourself to the word of the Lord. Know his word and you will hear him speak. And to know his word, his living word, you have to know the spirit. You have to know the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to know the voice of the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to you, when he's revealing things to you, when he's guiding you. You need to tune your ears, your eyes, your mind, your heart, your soul to listen to the Holy Spirit. And this may take time. This may take detuning from all of the other voices, detuning from all of the other norms, stepping out of all of the other habits, my wife came up and introduced me tonight, and I now, 11 years into marriage, can pick out her voice if we all stand up and start talking, especially if she laughs. If we're on the opposite side of the room, I will, I will know her laugh in the midst of all of you laughing, in the midst of all of you talking. That wasn't the case when we first met. I couldn't have picked up her voice in the midst of all of the noise. It took time one-on-one -on -one together. It's taken time of talking together. It takes time to listen. It takes time to prioritize, to get to know her, what she's like, what she sounds like, what she talks about, how she, what she cares about. It takes time to reorient, step out of the world that you died to and got resurrected from and learn the voice of the Holy Spirit. You have to know his voice. You have to practice hearing his voice. You have to put the time in, the priority, the love, the relationship. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. Turn the other stuff down and grow in hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. And one thing that's going to really help you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. And another thing is going to be the church, the people of God. If you want to know how to hear God, you're going to hear him in the word, you're going to hear him by the Holy Spirit, and you're going to hear him in the church. You're going to hear him in, the, the, the Bible says that we are the body of Christ. We don't take that seriously. I don't think we believe that enough. Like, we're the body of Christ. It's more true than we know. 
The Bible tells us all of us, we hear in part. We need each other. We need the other parts to hear what the Lord is saying, to see what the Lord is doing. When the voice of the Lord is rare to you, get around people for whom it is not rare. When the vision of the Lord is infrequent for you, get around those who are experiencing the frequent vision of the Lord. Lean on each other, strengthen each other, counsel each other, encourage each other, give words to one another, give encouragements and correction, study the word of God together, listen to the Holy Spirit together, search the scriptures together, learn the scriptures together, learn each other's different experiences and all of these things. Let's rub together, church, to hear the head that we share. Take advantage of the fact That other people have different gifts than you. Don't get offended. Don't get insecure. Don't get scared. Don't get embarrassed. Lean in and praise the Lord. Oh, that person hears God better than I do. Sounds like you should hang out with that person more. We I'm just gonna go ahead and say this for, for us. Like, we have got to do more of this. All of us. I'll start with me, but let's just be honest. All of us. We have got to talk to each other more, ask each other more questions, humbly submit things more to each other. You need to ask your pastors and elders input on more things. You need to ask your life group about more things. Don't you? You you do. We all do. Because, you know, we love each other and Jesus loves us and we all want to hear God. But we get on this island so often, it's like, ooh, the measure of my maturity is going to be if I heard God about this big decision by myself, and I got to prove it to me, and I got to prove it to God, and I got to prove it to my life group that I can hear God. You know all that conversation we were having about sheep on Sunday? That is a sheep in danger. That's how you hear God, the word, the spirit, and the church. What, what am I listening for? Speak, Lord, I'm listening. What are, what, are, what are you listening for? What should we be tuning our ears for? Well, Samuel, let's learn from him. He says, speak, Lord. Eli coaches him and says, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. That is the heart that hears God. Lord your servant. He is the Lord. He is the Lord over all. He is the Lord of all. He is the one on the throne. He says what he wants to say. And he's right. Right? This is not genie. Your master is listening. Lord. Lord. Your servant is listening. In right awe, in right fear, in right reverence, in revelation of his goodness and his immensity and eternity and in revelation of himself, Lord. If you really know him, you will address him, Lord. <laughs> Lord, your servant is listening. What you're listening for is your Lord to speak to his servant. He's going to speak his plans. He's going to speak about his ways. He's going to use his voice. He's going to talk to you about his agenda. It's not just this whole thing about, you know, it's not really usually going to be about future telling and and making you look big and strong and him saying what you want him to say the way that you want him to say it. He's going to talk to you about assignments in his kingdom because he's the Lord and he's building his kingdom and you're a part of it and you get to be adopted into it, but he's still the Lord of it and you are his servant. He's going to speak to you about repentance and turning from sin. He's going to speak to you about holiness and being set apart for him. He's going to speak to you about a heart that burns for him and has affections only for him. He's going to speak to you about returning to him. He's going to highlight some things that are distracting you away from what it is that he's trying to say. He's going to call you to obedience. He's going to call you to perseverance. 
He's going to call you to endurance, to faithfulness to his name. What's he going to say? He's going to reveal himself to you. He isn't revealing you to you. That's, that's not the main thing that's happening here. Yes, we pray for direction and all of that. And we must understand we are his servant and he is the Lord. And any of the direction that I'm looking for, I'm really, what I need is him. And he knows that. What am I listening for? I'm listening for him to speak to me about him and what's best for him and how I can best serve him and how I can best know him and how I can best be a part of what he's doing. And I have all of my desires and I have all of my things and most of the time I gotta get it all out. Right? Or is that just me? Okay. You know the whole groaning's too deep for words thing? That is me getting my agenda out before I'm ready to listen. Speak, Lord, I'm listening, but really what I need to do is talk and tell you about all these things going on and all of these questions that I have and all of these needs in my life and all of the things I'm scared of and that I need you to do. And here's all my good ideas about how you can solve all of my problems. Okay. (laughs) Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. What do you have to say? That's what we're listening for. How how do I interpret what he says? Once I hear him say something, how do I interpret what he says? Well, two things you don't do. First, don't run away and ignore whatever he said. So that's what I did. That night I had that encounter with God. I didn't go back to church didn't go to life group, didn't respond at all for like eight more months. And they were pretty crappy eight months. Shocker of all shockers, right? So don't be like this guy first. Can you do that? Check. All right, nice. Second, don't run off and do your own thing with what God said to you. Take it back through the word Take it back through the spirit. Take it back through the church for interpretation, for clarity, for action, for more development, to understand, oh, God spoke to me, but I'm just one part of his body that's building his kingdom of which he is the king and head. And so maybe what he's doing in me isn't about what me and I can do for him, but what we can do for our Lord. God's not speaking to you just for you. You're part of his body. And and what he's calling you to is not apart from his body. It's not apart from him, that's for sure. It's not apart from his head. Don't, Don't just run off and say, well, I got my word from the Lord, and here's how all the ways I can imagine what it means. Come back to the word. Come back to the spirit. Come back to the church. Something else you can do when it comes to interpreting what is God saying, be patient. Be patient in the Lord fulfilling his word. Praise God, it's never by your effort. We love singing that song until we get a word from the Lord. And we're like, praise God, it's by my effort. Let's go. I got this. This is all these Bible verses I got memorized. I have a vision from the Lord. You don't know God's timeline. You don't know how it involves everybody else. Stay surrendered. Come back to the word. Come back to the Holy Spirit. Come back to the church. Don't go running off on your own. Be patient in fulfillment. Surrender the fulfillment. When God gives you a word, you really should give it back to him to find out whatever God means by it. It's not about what what do I mean by it? What do I want it to mean on my timeline? God, what do you mean? What does this look like? How do I do this with you and with your people? You need to surrender imagination and ambition when you hear the word of the Lord. Hearing the word of the Lord is not about you getting a vision that everybody else needs to get on board with and affirm. It's not about what you can make it mean that sounds like what you want it to sound like. The word of the Lord is a constant call to you to surrender your ambition into what he's doing. He is the Lord, and you are his servant. 
Vision in the Christian life does not come from brainstorming and ideating and dreaming and imagining all of the big things that you can do for God. Samuel didn't come to God with a vision. You're not going to find a prophet that came to God with a great big idea for God. Paul didn't give God an idea for what to do with his life. None of the apostles gave God the idea for what he needed to do with them in their life. (sighs) This will step on toes for all of us. God doesn't need my dreams. I need his. God doesn't need my ideas. I need his. God doesn't need my ambition. I need to submit to him. Vision in the Christian life is about crucifying the ambitions of the flesh so that your will can be resurrected to new life in submission. In submission to the will of God. And then we get to unify around his will as his body and participate with him in seeing his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His prophetic word doesn't need your interpretation. God is looking for surrendered people, dead people, obedient people, people who understand he is the Lord. And I am his servant. I'm listening. He may take you on a process of coming in line with it. (laughs) He will. And that's where the patience and surrender comes in. He's fathering you into the word he's spoken. He's fathering you into the kingdom that he's building. He's bringing you along in the patience and in the surrender and in the endurance and the refining. He's fathering you and maturing you and growing you up into who he knows you are in him. All we have to do is take up our cross and die to ourselves. Praise the Lord. It's never by my effort. Verse 11, we get all this terrifying vision that we all got really uncomfortable with. You know when it started off and you're like, what am I about to do? Everybody's ears will tingle. And we're all like, oh, shukata. (laughs) And then he's like, I'm killing Eli. And you're like, oh. (laughs) Wrong verse. (laughs) Andrew, it's kingdom conference. We don't read those verses at conferences. Stop at the tingling, Lord. Eli didn't hear what he wanted to hear. Samuel didn't hear what he wanted to hear. But Eli is coaching Samuel on how to hear God. God is using Eli, who he is rejecting, to raise up Samuel as a prophet to hear the voice of the Lord. So Eli didn't hear what he wanted to hear, but he knew it was still the voice of the Lord. Samuel is a boy. The audible voice of God is speaking to him, and he thinks it's Eli's voice. He needs some help. Eli, the veteran who's on his way out, understands, no, that's the voice of the Lord. This boy needs to know the voice of the Lord. How did Eli know it was the Lord? Well, like I told you, the end of chapter 2, Eli already was told all of this in the end of the previous chapter. Eli already had a prophet come and tell him all of this about him and his family. Everything Samuel heard in chapter 3, Eli already heard in chapter 2. In chapter 2, God rejects his high priest. Chapter 2 is about God decommissioning his high priest. Chapter 3 is about God commissioning his prophet. And before Eli is decommissioned, God uses him to commission God's prophet. And Eli's last recorded lesson to Samuel, the last thing we hear of Eli before he dies, the old man being rebuked from the Lord, Being told he's going to die, his sons are going to die, and his family's no longer the line of the high priest. 
He still, in one last sort of breath as high priest, partners with the Lord in what he's doing. And the last recorded lesson that he gives to Samuel is the most important lesson that a prophet can learn. And Eli sees it in the moment. He sees what happened, what's happening. God is raising up his prophet. He's kicking me out, but he's raising up the next generation. It is this boy who's been in my house. This, is, this boy is God's man. And he's being raised up to be a prophet. And Eli has to help him learn the most important lesson a prophet can learn. It's the most important lesson any disciple can learn. Any disciple of the Lord, any servant of the Lord has to learn this lesson. Eli had taught Samuel how to hear God's voice. Now God needed Eli to teach Samuel how to respond to God's voice. No matter what the Lord says, no matter what the Lord is doing, no matter what the Lord speaks to his servant, the response is, it is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is our Father in heaven. Let him do what is good in his eyes. You want to hear the voice of God? Come to him with this heart. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And when he speaks, stay humble under his word. Run to the word and the spirit in the, tr in the church so that you can know for yourself and be affirmed by the body of Christ. That was the Lord. And whatever it is, wherever he's leading, whatever he's doing, whatever he's speaking about, let your heart, let our hearts be, Lord, do what is good in your eyes. Full surrender all the way. This prayer, speak, Lord, I'm listening. It's a prayer of getting on the altar. Let's stand. And have the worship team come back up. We're going to put ourselves before the Lord tonight. My invitation to you tonight is come and put yourself before the Lord. I love what Clay introduced at the beginning. All that's on your mind, all that's on your heart, all that's in your life, it, it matters and it's good. And what we need the most is to hear the Lord. With this conference, what we believe Jesus has promised us is that he's not just going to give us encounters with him, but he's going to give us encounters with him where we get assignments in his kingdom. Samuel didn't just have an encounter with God. He got an assignment from God. And I'm believing that for every single one of you. I've been praying it for many, many days. I believe that the Lord has promised us that he's coming to speak. And he's going to speak with assignments in his kingdom. This is why we offer everything to the Lord that's on our minds and on our hearts. What we're saying is, Lord, I, I know, I know here's, here's all of me. Now, what do you have? I want you to be listening to the Lord in this time and over the course of this weekend, not just for what you want to hear and what you need to hear, but Lord, your servant is listening. What is your assignment for me? Would you come, Holy Spirit? Would you bring us before your altar as we come and minister to you, Lord? Our prayer is simple. Speak, Lord. We're listening.